Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven talk radio that promotes happiness from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights trendsetters and change agents who offer sound emotional fitness tips for improving mental muscle tone and greater well-being. Guest experts include a diverse and proactive collection of the greatest thinkers and doers who are devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology coach, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in the fields of sustainable happiness, mindfulness, and positive lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio, broadcasting consciously prepared brain food from the beaches of Malibu, California. Each week, we explore the very serious business of happiness, sustainable well-being, and human flourishing. We are not talking about that annoying yellow smiley face. No, no, no. We are talking about something much deeper and critical to the success of humanity. Authentic happiness is not selfish, egotistical, or narcissistic. In fact, it is essential in order for humankind to thrive. Sustainable happiness is important because it not only elevates our own well-being locally, but also contributes to collective global flourishing. The achievement of a happy life is not only positively good for us, it is constructively good for those around us. In short, happiness matters. Happiness comes from the heart. And this show is most definitely all about the heart. And today we are talking about the heart, the head, the body, and all the things that lie inside of it. We're talking about our health and aging optimally. How do we take care of ourselves? How do we prevent ourselves from getting sick? And when we do get sick, how do we take care of ourselves well? My first guest is Dr. Sharon Burquist, who is a board-certified internal medicine doctor, researcher, teacher, and speaker specializing in preventative medicine and healthy aging. She is a Rollins Distinguished Clinician on the faculty of Emory School of Medicine and the medical director of Emory's Executive Health Center, a state-of-the-art, evidence-based lifestyle prevention program. Dr. Burquist is really interested in sharing knowledge about health and wellness and has contributed to over 150 media segments around the world, in fact. And I want to get her on so we can immediately jump in. But I want you to know that Dr. Burquist has also graduated from Yale University and completed her medical education and training at Harvard Medical School. Welcome back, Dr. Burquist. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me back, Lisa. Oh, it is a pleasure. So today we're talking about caring for our changing bodies, and you have written a wonderful book entitled 10 Principles for Optimal Health and Longevity. And today we are just going to jump right in about prevention. Absolutely, Lisa. I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that our body changes each decade. So our bodies in our 20s is very different than our bodies in our 50s. So understanding the changes that take place each decade can help us not only not be anxious when we notice these changes, but they help us be proactive and not reactive um, in how we age into our later years. Ah, very, very good point. Talk a little bit about um, how we age cellularly, what to look for. You know, in our 20s, what's going on? And then you mentioned 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. Let's let's just stop in the 50s as an example. So what uh, the 20s versus the 50s in contrast. Yeah, so you know, every part of our body goes through um, some very defined changes. Um, But you can think of your 50s and and 40s really like a second puberty because so many changes take place in midlife, um, in our hormones, um, also in our inflammation and how our bodies function, um, that how you take care of yourself in those years are critical in determining how your later years shape up. That's Um, fascinating. I had never heard of of the 40s being the second puberty. If you think 
think about it, you're really going through another spurt of sorts. Um, hormones are changing dramatically, especially for women going through menopause, but also in men. Uh, men experience a 1% to 2% decline in testosterone each year beginning the 40s. Um, so what that translates to, for example, in terms of body composition, is that during our 40s, we're losing some fat and we're losing some muscle and our body's converting it to fat. Um, and because muscle breaks down um, calories about three times more efficiently than fat, we end up accumulating a higher body composition of fat. So even if we're eating the same, we tend to gain weight. As we go into our 50s, you're adding hormonal changes on top of that. So for example, women are losing estrogen and our relative amount of testosterone to estrogen increases. So what we're seeing then is our body shape changes more from a pear shaped with fat on our thighs to an apple shape where there's more fat around the belly. In men, a similar change happens as testosterone declines. And belly fat doesn't just sit there, it's an organ. It secretes adipokines. That's a mix of hormones as well as immune chemicals called cytokines. And those increase inflammation. That inflammation increases risk of insulin resistance and heart disease. Insulin resistance can make it harder to break down sugar, which then adds to the difficulty in losing weight. And we end up in this vicious cycle of weight gain and conversion of muscle into fat. Wow. That is amazing. I was aware of some of this, but I wasn't aware of the reason why. And in, more importantly than the reason why is what can we do about it? Yeah, and that's really the, the key. Um, so beginning your 40s, as you're naturally losing some of that muscle and it's getting converted into fat, the key is you have to do muscle and strength resistance exercises. You can't really just eat less and eat less because every time you do that, your metabolism slows down. You've got to actively build muscle. And what a lot of people do as they get older is they get more sedentary instead of more active. That's the opposite of what your body needs you to do. Wow. Another exercise, exercise, exercise. Move your body or lose the agility of it. Absolutely. Um, exercise remains fundamental into your 50s as you're going through hormonal changes. Not only is the strength resistance key in helping you prevent that belly fat, but aerobic exercise, just walking, cycling, basketball, dancing, anything you enjoy can help you burn calories because Keep in mind, when you gain weight in your 50s, that weight is going to preferentially turn into belly fat based on those hormonal changes. I have heard, though, that as we age, I think particularly for women, that it's important to have a little extra padding, that as we age, we do better at, at women aging with a little bit more fat. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm not really referencing the belly fat, but is that true? Well, there, there are two types of fat, Lisa. There's visceral fat. That's the kind of fat that gets in between our organs um, and the kind that you really can't pinch. And then there's the subcutaneous fat. That's the kind that you can pinch under your skin. Ah. Uh. Yeah, it's the visceral fat that causes the damage. It's actually one of the most harmful organs in your body because of the hormones it secretes. The subcutaneous fat is not as dangerous, and having a little bit of subcutaneous fat can help, for example, as you get older, falling becomes a really big risk. And having that little bit of padding may buffer those falls a little bit. Um, it can also protect your bones and your muscles, your um, tendons, so you may get a little less injury from repetitive movements and sitting for prolonged amounts of time. So a little bit of fat, in the subcutaneous skin can be helpful, but I think the key is that most people in this country are nowhere near at risk of losing too much fat. I think we tend to have the opposite problem. So I think focusing on keeping that fat in check is a much bigger struggle for us than making sure we have enough. 
Indeed it is. And I want to just go back to um, the fat issue and and keeping fat under control. And you mentioned uh, something about inflammation as we age as well. If one were to follow the Mediterranean diet and uh, keep a diet that is relatively low in inflammatory foods, is that one additional way that we can combat the risks? Yeah, Lisa, that is such a great point. I think we underestimate how much we can influence the inflammation in our bodies. So naturally with age, inflammation increases, but diet can really keep that at bay. The Mediterranean diet in particular can be very effective because it's a mix of a lot of anti-inflammatory foods as well as antioxidants, and antioxidants can decrease inflammation. So the Mediterranean diet, for people who are not familiar with it, is one that's really high in fruits and vegetables, contains a lot of nuts and seeds, and a lot of healthy, low-fat proteins. So lean fish, lean chicken, um, a lot of plant-based proteins, um, such as tofu, for example, or lentils and beans. And it's very low in saturated fat. That's the type of fat from animal sources. Um, and it's low in the refined sugars and carbohydrates. So those are the carbs that you get from, um, like, white flour and white sugar or desserts. And, of course, uh, it has red wine, <laughs> which is... Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, but before we do, I want to uh, turn our listeners over to your website and where they can contact you to learn more about you, your book, 10 Principles for Optimal Health and Longevity. Dr. Berquist can be found at drsharonberquist.com, on Twitter at shberquistmd, and on Facebook at Sharon. Berquist. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll carry on the discussion of caring for our changing bodies, a decade-by-decade decade approach. Here come the tunes. We will be right back, and that's a promise. We know that life can be tough, and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, and follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. We'll be right back after this quick break. Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if? Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are We Happy Yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast because we are talking about changing our bodies or our changing bodies rather and a decade by decade approach for what goes on as we age. My guest today is Dr. Sharon Burquist, who is a board certified internal medicine doctor, researcher, teacher and speaker specializing in preventative medicine and healthy aging. She is a distinguished clinician on the faculty of Emory School of Medicine and a medical director at Emory's Executive Health Center. So Dr. Burquist, prior to the break we were talking about the metabolic and body composition changes that happen as we age. And you mentioned about um, things that happen in menopause as well as menopause, the differences between the two types of fat, visceral and subcutaneous, and talking about reducing fat in our bodies as we age because it can contribute to um, disease. 
Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. Um, so I think these body composition changes are, are so critical in determining how our quality of life ends up as we get older. A lot of debility, um, really dependence, forms from losing our, our muscle mass um, and losing our balance and flexibility. So our body composition is really at the heart of our quality of life as we get older. I wanted to ask you a question about um, menopause and the reduction of estrogen and the increase of testosterone. Is that why women tend to um, perhaps become more aggressive, it's been known, uh, as we age and more feisty? Is that because of the increase in testosterone, more risk-taking perhaps? Um, You know, part of it is hormonal, Lisa, but part of it is at the same time our brain is changing in, in very defined ways. And our brain, both in women and men, as we get into our 50s, kind of reaches this point of peak connectivity in that we can start pulling information uh, from both the left brain and the right brain. So we unleash this creativity that we physiologically didn't have the capability of having in our 20s. Ah, okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, For those of you who are unaware of what the left and the right side of the brains do under our human hoods, Dr. Berkowitz, hopefully you can tell us. (laughs) So we typically refer to left brain and right brain people as differentiating people who are more analytic, kind of more the math science type versus people who are more the creative reading and writing types. And and we view people kind of stereotypically as left brain and right brain depending on what their strengths are. And as we get older, our brain starts to, to compensate and recruit from different areas of the brain when we're problem solving. And that can actually work to our advantage in that we can pull from both types of thinking, both the analytic as well as the emotional and creative. This is fascinating. In your book, 10 Principles for Optimal Health and Longevity, you talk about the brain aging. It's as much about growth as it is decline. And I and now I see your point, that it is about this synthesis that occurs in mid and, and later life, which is, I think, quite optimistic. <laughs> It is very optimistic, Lisa. You know, we think of our brain aging as just being downhill. You know, we always think of senior moments and and focus on what we lose, in particular how we lose our memory. But it's just as important to think about what we're gaining. You know, our brain has the ability to create new brain cells. We call that neurogenesis, as well as create new pathways Um, in how our um, nerves communicate. As we get older, well into our later years, even into our 70s, we can continue to build these new pathways. So we can continue to build wisdom and knowledge because we can cross-index and pull all these bits of information as we get older, and we can harness and manage it in a way that we simply can't do when we're younger. So there's an upside. There's a reason why, you know, most CEOs are in their 50s and not in their 20s, at least. Um, Nowadays, that's changing, but that's generally the rule. This, to me, is fascinating and fantastic news, because when you look at how the brain changes as we age, starting, for example, in the 40s, talk a little bit about the episodic memory that we have. You know, we have sort of that those senior moments. Um, and then as we move through the 50s, 60s and beyond, sort of the, 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 the highlighted things that happen to us. Yeah, in our 40s, we do start to notice some lapses in our memory. And these are usually very harmless. I mean, we, you know, kind of call them senior moments, um, and that's become a joke for a lot of people. But the truth is a lot of people don't know when to worry and what's normal. I get asked that very frequently by my patients. And the two normal types of changes are in episodic memory. So that's the kind of memory you need to know context um, and proper names and places and people. So when we 
can't think of something that's on the tip of our tongue, for example, the, the name of a hotel on a vacation we went to or the name of a person um, that we're almost embarrassed to not be able to recall, that's a very normal change. We actually have a term for that. We call them tip of tongue lapses. <laughs> Okay. Exactly. It's just like it sounds. Check. Um, I got that. Working, <laughs> <laughs> and working memory is another normal change. So working memory is the type of memory you need to do a multitask function. For example, if you need to get some money out of your wallet, but your wallet is in a living room, you need to first remember to walk to the living room and then when you get there, you have to remember to reach for your wallet and get the money out. But a lot of or times, even what you came there for, right? right what we what did you go there for, anyways? Exactly, and that's a normal change. That's a decline in your working memory. You have difficulty stacking one memory on top of another in the process of accomplishing a task. Um, so a lot of people worry about these changes, but these are perfectly normal. And they start to occur in your 40s. And one of the most important things you can do in your 40s, and I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken recorder, um, but exercise, again, is on top of the list. And the reason that's important for our brain is by increasing blood flow to the brain and increasing mm. the nutrients, we stimulate nerve growth factors in our brain, in particular brain-derived nootrophic factor. And that factor helps you create those new brain cells and the new pathways that we were talking about. So it, exercise, interesting. Yeah, it actually changes the structure and function of your brain. What about uh, like video games? I was listening to NPR the other day and they were talking about uh, at UCSD, University of California at San Diego, there's a lab that has been um, doing a study with adult video games for I think it's been about the last 10 years and tracking the cognitive functioning of its participants and they showed a 33% reduction in memory impairment from playing these very sophisticated and yet fun video games. Yeah, Lisa, that's a great question because there's such a large market now um, for, you know, they use the term edutainment, um, which is a blend of education and entertainment. These brain games are really bestsellers in the market. The study, um, the ACTIVE study, A-C-T-I-V-E, which is this long 10-year study that I think you just referenced, um, is one of the best designed studies on brain games. It's really the gold standard. And in this study, they found that one particular type of brain game um, that focuses on speed of processing um, can actually reduce the risk of dementia. The most and, oh, this is important because the speed was, uh, that's right, I, now I remember, that was the element that made it unique. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and that is what's really differentiated that particular type of brain game because Historically, when you look at studies on brain games, what they found repeatedly is that brain games make you better at that particular type of game. For example, if you do crossword puzzles, you get really good at crossword puzzles, but it doesn't necessarily spill over into other types of tasks, like you won't drive better because you're good at crossword puzzles. So. The, that's really been the shortcoming of brain games. And when you look at other studies that are observational studies, and we have a lot of these studies that observe people over time to see who ages the best in terms of brain health, what we see is that lifelong learning is what really matters. So brain games can be a smart a small part of that, but keep in mind that what really matters is continual learning, challenging the way you see the world, um, learning new languages, uh, traveling to different parts of the world, starting new hobbies, because every time you challenge your current way of thinking, you're building new pathways in your brain. And the more you learn different things, you're crisscrossing more and more different pathways. And ultimately, you're really taking your brain from being an old DSL network into broadband. 
Wow. We are out of time. Dr. Sharon Berkowitz, you're going to have to come back, which I know we've got a whole series that we're embarking on. So I I already know that's happening. To learn more about the fabulous Dr. Sharon Berkowitz, please visit her website, drsharonberkowitz.com. On Twitter, you can find her at shberkowitzmd. And on Facebook, Dr. Sharon Berkowitz. Once again, the book is 10 Principles for Optimal Health and Longevity. Stay tuned. We'll, there will be more when we come back, and there will be more with the fabulous Dr. Sharon Berkowitz in the future on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. Here come the tunes. Nothing gives happiness like a free gift. Unwrap your present by signing up for Happiness Headlines, our monthly e-zine at harvestinghappiness.com. Stay tuned for more after the break. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and sometimes we all need support. We all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstance. Sure, things will inevitably happen in our lives that are out of our control. There is only ever one thing that is totally within our control, ourselves. When we have command of ourselves, we are better prepared to handle life and bounce back more quickly when challenges arise. Whether you see the glass as half empty or half full, the glass has the capacity to hold more. You have the capacity to be happier. The tool to harvesting your happiness is within your grasp. Are we happy yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we're continuing our conversation about peace and the pursuit of happiness, but we're going to take it from a different angle this time. And this is through conflict, collateral damage, and humanitarianism. My next guest is Daniel Rothbart, who is a professor of conflict analysis and resolution at the School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, George Mason University. Professor Rothbart specializes in identity-based conflicts, civilians in war, and emotions and conflict. He serves as the co-director of the Program on Prevention of Mass Violence. He also chairs the Sudan Task Group, an organization that seeks to build long-term peace in this East African country. His academic writings include more than 50 articles and book chapters in scholarly journals and volumes. His recent publications in conflict analysis and resolution include the following books, Identity, Morality, and Threat, Studies in Violent Conflict, Why They Die, Civilian Devastation in Violent Conflict, Civilian and Modern War, Armed Conflict and the Ideology of Violence, and Violent Conflict and Peacebuilding, the Continuing Crisis in Darfur. He's currently exploring the power of moral emotions, shame, humiliation, dignity, pride, as central to protracted conflicts or to their resolution. Welcome, Professor Rothbart. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure having you. This is a a, a difficult subject and one that uh, most of us don't really want to talk about. We want to run and hide and not talk about the dirty parts of war. Right. Well, um, it's a very unpleasant topic, and I think there's a lot of motivation for people not to look at the, uh, you know, la- layers and layers of tragedy of uh, modern conflict. Um, so I uh, so I understand that motive, but unfortunately, it is it is part of what's going on in the world. It is, and in in my view as a layperson in this arena, I look at what goes on around the world in terms of violence as a projection, you know, of the collective consciousness. You know, it's an expression of what most of us don't express, and those in power or who seek to achieve power are doing so. Well, I think you're getting right to the heart of of a challenge, which is that... um, we want to look at war, at, at violent conflict, in a way that validates who we are as human beings. I'm talking about civilians who want to see their soldiers as heroes, which is totally understandable, um, and many civilians who then become soldiers. 
So, of course, they want to understand the positive glories, the, the parades and the, the self-elevation. Unfortunately, there's a major side of contemporary conflict, which, um, which is basically which people are blind to. I think that there's uh, the consciousness of society, as you mentioned, also includes layers of willful blindness um, and almost uh, an attempt to run away from some of the some of the real layers of tragedy of, of war. And I'm talking here about what happens to civilian noncombatants. And let's talk about that. At any given time, there are dozens of, of wars going on in the world, and people yeah. I don't think are really aware of that, certainly not so much in the Western world where we're not exposed to these kinds of crises on a daily basis. And the collateral damage, of course, as you mentioned, are these civilian noncombatants. Talk a little bit about the experience for that individual, because I don't think we're aware collectively what it's well, like. Yeah, um, I think, you know, there are reports that happen after the fact, and then, you know, the world is appropriately shocked about what happens to civilians in Syria, for example. Syria is a you know, is, is, is the, tr the enormous humanitarian crisis of, of um, at least 100,000 civilians who have been killed, uh, civilian noncombatants, um, one third of whom are, um, are uh, no, I'm sorry, nine, at least 10,000 of whom are children. And then there is the forced displacement that we all have heard about where you know, massive segments of the population are forced to uh, forced to flee their homes, and this is really a tremendous devastation to a family. When a family is forced from their home, in many cases they've lived in that land for generations. It creates a psychic rupture of of trauma, and many times the families um, split. You know, have to travel separately. Um, children without parents, and then, of course, they are subject to tremendous vulnerabilities of disease, and then we've all heard about the tragic case of uh, the flotillas um, in the Mediterranean, uh, many of which you know, have sunk and caused thousands of deaths. So what happened in Syria is a large-scale crisis of what's happened, what happens routinely in um, uh Contemporary conflict. And let me just say this, you know, I, you started with a, a wonderful uh, perspective of looking at kind of our consciousness about this. A lot of people have a view that war is between, you know, one military of one nation against military of another nation and, you know, fighting in the fields, in open fields. So that basically is, is a relic of the past. Contemporary violent conflict involves two kinds of, of violence. One is between, you know, military on one side against military on the other side, obviously. And there's another major segment of violence between military and civilians. And this happens all the time with protracted conflicts. As conflicts uh, are prolonged, you know, over a year or so on, civilians are routinely devastated, sometimes intentionally so, as in cases of genocide, like in the Rwanda uh, genocide of 1994, and other times not intentional, but they're kind of in the way, um, as it were. They're treated as objects, as collateral, and their suffering is kind of an just a negative cost on the way for militaries to engage in their strategy. And when we talk about collateral, it's not just the byproduct of war, but in the case I think you're talking about in Syria in particular, where civilians are actually used as shields yeah. in so, conflict. That's right. So um, you know, one horrific tactic that's sometimes used by militia groups um, and it's used by ISIS. ISIS basically is engaged in a genocidal violence right now, um, and they um, they have no desire to comply with international humanitarian law. 
Um, and they use human beings as shields, as you say. And um, they obviously rationalize this. And this is not unusual. It's not just unique to contemporary times. There have been terrorists, if we call this a terrorist group, um, terrorists for, for centuries have violated uh, any sense of humanitarian norm, and they 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 don't they have no reluctance to destroy civilians. So the the kind of terrorism that goes on, where human beings are used as shields, or the so-called suicide bombings of civilians, um, this has been going on for a long, long time. And it's, uh, it's not new. It's, it's just it's, it's the, the media gets is getting it out there. We're seeing it. Right. Of course. Yeah. I mean, the media coverage is amazing. Um, the media coverage is, is just incredible. And they sometimes it's, it's literally minutes after um, a tragedy happened. That, that was the case with the bombing in Nice, France. I'm sorry, the truck, uh, the, the truck um, running over civilians. Was it 83 civilian casual civilian fatalities in Nice? The media basically... Um, has it has it um, uh, very quickly responded, but on the other hand, there that kind of distorts us from realizing that there's there's devastation that goes on with civilians that the media do not cover, and as I say, large scale civilian uh, forced exile, and also there's conflicts that media just completely ignore. For example, the um, we're all now aware of the use of, of um, chemical weapons by the Assad government in Syria. But there was also, the media did not cover the use of chemical weapons by the Sudanese government against um, its own people last year. Amnesty International has, re- has recorded and reported that um, uh, at least 200 civilians were killed when the government of Sudan used chemical weapons on its own people. So unfortunately, Sudan is not among the countries that gets large media coverage. And yet this kind of devastation goes on. We are going to need to take a break. And before we do, I want to send our listeners over to your site over at George Mason um, University. And I'm going to spell it out because it's a bit of a, of a, of an odd domain name. It's not odd, but I mean, just it's, it's long. Um, and um, listeners can visit um, scar dot. Yes. yes. And that's S C A R scar dot G M U dot E D U slash people. And then connect with you by after the slash people slash Daniel Rothbart. And let me repeat that. It's scar dot G M U dot E D U slash people slash Daniel hyphen Rothbart, and they can also connect with you on Twitter um, via at scar at GMU. And we're, we're talking about all of your books in a certain sense, but the one that I think um, uh, uh, we're really discussing today is the one about identity, morality, and threat studies in violent conflict and why they die, civilian devastation in violent conflict. And when we come back, I'd love to get more deeply into the book and and some of the solutions that what we as everyday people, as civilians in a relatively safe and calm space can do to help affect change. Um, Are there any other uh, places people can look to connect with you, Professor Rothbart? Um, Well, um, my email address, uh, which is... um, D R O T H B A R at G M U dot E D U. Perfect. And when we come back, we will uh, carry on the conversation. Here come those tunes. Who says money can't buy happiness? Check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life and other fun, fashionable, and inspiring items at shophappy at harvestinghappiness.com. We'll be right back after this quick break. Do you find yourself saying things like, I'll be happy when, or I'll be happy if? Does the finish line for happiness keep moving? 
Does the bar keep getting higher? What's getting in the way of your happiness right now? Too much going on? Working too much? Not working enough? Having too many responsibilities? Not having enough money, enough time, enough space? The list goes on and on. It becomes difficult to see all that we have if we focus on scarcity. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one. And sometimes we all need support. Are We Happy Yet? is not another self-help book. It's a guidebook for learning how to harvest happiness through self-mastery, which is the key ingredient into building resilience, hardiness, grit, and emotional stability. Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Each day we get to choose how we are going to show up for life. And at times we need tips for strengthening our well-being. Learn training strategies for greater emotional fitness and improved mental muscle tone at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast because we're talking about something that is not comfortable necessarily, but something that is truly important, and that is awareness of the spoils of war and civilian non-combatant suffering at a higher rate than their combatant counterparts in war. And with me today is Professor Daniel Rothbart, who is a professor of conflict analysis and resolution at the School for Conflict Analysis Resolution at George Mason University. He's the author of several books, and we're talking today about identity, morality, and threat, as well as another book, Why They Die, Civilian Devastation in Violent Conflict. So, Professor Rothbart, prior to the break, we were talking about uh, examples such as in um, Syria and, and Darfur. And I want to sort of circle back the conversation to what we can do about it, what the average individual can do at a local level to affect change. Right. Um, well, so there's a lot of things that we can do as citizens of this this wonderful country um, and as human beings. Um, the first thing that is so important is to insist upon uh, our leaders, political and military leaders, that we have a system of counting how many civilians are killed in war. Um, it's very difficult to know precisely how many civilians um, suffer in, in war. And we, there are certain countries and certain wars in which it's happened. Actually, the um, Iraq War, uh, Iraq War II, that involved the United States and allies, did have a system of counting the total number of fatalities. And, um, and also the World Health Organization was involved in that. But very few countries really implement a system for counting. Um, and this is really uh, an enormous lack and, and needs to be done. Um, and there's another thing that we can do as citizens, and this I feel very strongly, is to demand of our political and military leaders to tell the truth about the realities of war, both from the soldier's standpoint and from the civilian standpoint. I think, as I mentioned before, there's kind of a willful blindness. Um, there's very strong motive to disguise or to block out our awareness of what happens to civilians. It's in the interest, clearly, of many military um, systems to be blind to what goes on to, to civilians, obviously, because the militaries don't, don't want to be culpable. But if we're human beings and we hold to high moral standards, and by the way, many countries say that their militaries do comply uh, to high moral standards of international humanitarian law, then I think that the political and military leaders have a moral obligation to tell the truth about what happens to civilians and what their, what their involvement is in the... Um, in causing civilian suffering. And related to that, I think that we should demand of our uh, political leaders and, and our military leaders 
to address civilian suffering after the violence ends, after the bombs stop falling and one country claims victory or whatever. Um, which, by the way, from a civilian standpoint, there's really not much, uh, not much value in declaring victory. From the civilians who are engulfed in the carnage of violence against their will, this idea of victory is really quite shallow. Um, so I think that nations should, especially those nations who claim to maintain a high moral standards in their military, they should be committed to redress some of the suffering that civilians have, um, have endured. Um, I'm not saying this has never happened. And the most obvious case is the Marshall Plan uh, that the U.S. and allies engaged in after World War II. And in fact, um, the U.S., United States uh, does uh, award certain um, compensation for civilians who are killed in Iraq. Uh, there's a certain monetary uh, figure that is given to the families of civilians who are killed. So it's not rare. Um, I think all countries should be committed to that and expand upon that. And we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, social responsibility on a level that um, maybe we're not familiar with. I mean, if, if we yeah. go in or we're a party to war in another country, it's not good enough to just be uh, have a perceived victory. It's mm -hmm. uh, we, I think there is that moral obligation um, to help repair really almost irreparable moral injury. Yeah. Um, so, again, if we're really um, uh, claiming we being any state, I'm not just referring to the United States. But if a state claims to have high moral standards in, in a just war and, and the proper engagement in war, then they should prepare in advance before the, or at the initial stages of war, um, prepare for how they're going to help civilians who are devastated by the carnage. Because as I say, as the war, as, as wars prolong, as they engulf civilians, there will be massive civilian suffering. This is not rare, and um, it's, not ne it's not always necessary. So, now, and, and, and talk a little bit about a, sort of the secondary trauma a, a, in terms yeah. of the suffering, because there's the obvious suffering that goes on when one's home is bombed and taken away and the, and the loss of a loved one. But the secondary part of the suffering is uh, maybe a health crisis that uh, ensues as a result of war and then not being able to obtain proper medical treatment. And right. that it just perpetuates a cycle that is very challenging to, to get out of. Right. So there's a big difference between civilians who are injured or are killed from the direct engagement or engulf, being engulfed in war, and then those civilians who suffer from the indirect effects, as you were, as you were saying. And so, for example, um, when civilians are forced from their home, in some cases, as in a number of con conflicts in Africa, they have to travel literally thousands of miles. They have to walk um, thousands of miles to look for a refugee camp. Um, the United Nations has basically saved hundreds of thousands of people in Africa over the years. And yet that travel basically can be lead to their, their uh, death through starvation, through um, uh, injury, the effects of injury. And then, of course, there's the massive suffering and vulnerability of women who, in, in a number of conflicts, basically are subjected to sexual violence. Yes. Um, and this is both during the conflict where women basically are used as, as sex objects by by militants in a number of conflicts. Um, and then, of course, after the violence where women basically are vulnerable. And um, the youth. I also think about the the child soldiers, particularly in Africa, who are conscripted. They're given drugs um, right. and these these lost boys, you know, how, how do we help them? 
Yeah. So that's another layer of tragedy. And um, a number of African countries, um, uh, Sierra Leone um, and uh, Liberia and um, Sudan, they basically, um, a number of children have been soldiers. And then when the fighting ends, they are looking for some security. They're looking for some safety. And so the community is faced with a moral judgment, a moral quandary and social quandary. What do you do with a soldier who was 12 years old when, and it's usually he, but sometimes it's she, commits violence and then wants to come back into the community and um, live a different life? It's it's really a, a horrible problem. And the questions that you pose in your books and the answers that you provide in your books are compelling. And I do believe that we need to have more of this kind of conversation because maybe it could prevent some of the future conflicts through awareness, through education and through and through protest, you know, c- c- civil civil protest on our part. This is not OK. War is never a good thing. Right. Um, and I think we can basically take a humanitarian approach to war. And what that means is that we should demand that the enemy basically, instead of being injured, they should be captured. And maybe instead of being killed, they should be wounded. Um, Obviously, that's not ideal. Obviously, it would be better if there were no wars. But, um, but, But the enemy should be spared as much as possible. And of course, the non combatants should in particular be spared as much as possible. So um, I think we should demand of our leaders, as I say, um, a system that proactively engages us to prepare for what happens to civilians. Um, You know, we have an enormous commitment to health care for citizens in this country. And even though there's political controversies, we all know that everyone needs health care. And you need a complicated system of advanced, sophisticated professionals to provide us all with health care. Well, I think that we should have a system of health care for civilians who we know will be devastated in, um, in a protracted war. In other words, bring in our capacity, our humanitarian capacity to save lives bring it to civilians, even civilians in other countries. Yeah. And that's a humanitarian perspective that rises above uh, parochial you know, self-interest of any particular nation. Professor Rothbart, we are out of time. Once again, the book we were focusing on today, Why They Die, Civilian Devastation in Violent Conflict. To learn more about Professor Daniel Rothbart, please visit the website over at George Mason University. And I'm going to once again give that um, domain. It's scar, S-C-A-R dot G-M-U dot E-D-U slash people slash Daniel hyphen Rothbart. On Twitter, um, you can find him at scar at G-M-U. Professor Rothbart, thank you. Here are a few thoughts before we part. Happiness is not a destination. It cannot be bought, sold, or traded. It will never invite you to the party because happiness simply comes down to a choice to show up each and every day in the world with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. Thanks for joining us today on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen and my guest today, Stephen Kinzer and Daniel Rothbart, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember... Happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Join us each and every Wednesday for a brand new episode of consciously curated talk radio from the heart. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime from the comfort of wherever you are with hundreds of free downloadable podcasts from our libraries on Toginet iTunes, and SoundCloud. In a complicated world seemingly driven by nonstop negative news, Lisa's mission is to celebrate the upside of life and seek the silver lining of our challenges by transforming them into uplifting growth opportunities for all. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. 
Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.